Today, we learn how Emporia State is helping with the COVID-19 crisis and sit down with the director of the data management team to talk about reporting, learn about email encryption, and much, much more. I'm Tyler Parker, and this is It Only Takes a Minute. The COVID-19 crisis has had a huge impact on all of our lives, and we've covered all the ways that technology has helped ease the transition to learning and working online. But a few of our innovative staff have found a way to use technology in a different way, to help area healthcare workers. We sit down with Dr. Rob Gibson and Hind Ati with our learning technologies team to find out how. During the COVID-19 crisis, Personal protective equipment inventory for healthcare professionals are dangerously low. Modern problems need modern solutions. At Emporia State University, we are 3D printing face masks, face shields, and door holders for our community. This is a testament to our team's dedication and prowess. Let's find out more from Rob Gibson and Hind Ati. I found out about this through an article that was online. They talked about a dentist in Montana, um, a family dentistry group that had um, developed this face mask and put the models out there for people to download. And so I uh, had him download the um, the STL files, those are the uh, 3D print files, and um, he gave directions on um, where to find the filters and everything else. So we printed, um, I think it was one or two face masks just to start. And um, then I ordered um, the filters from another um, supplier in Billings, Montana. And they are working with the dentistry company to supply these filters. Um, and they are cut specifically for that size of mask. And uh, they are surgical grade. They're not N95s, which are the top tier. But surgical grade is the next best. And so we got 200 filters just to kind of start to see how it works. And we're going to try and print somewhere around 200 of the masks uh, to match the filters. And then we can always order more filters. And then at the same time, it had source files for shields. And so we downloaded the STLs for the shields. Okay, I'm printing the 3D mask with the filter, which is two pieces, like, as you can see, with the two pieces. Also, at the same time, we're printing the face shield, headband, and the bottom part for it. So it's, we're waiting now for the plastic, so they can wear this with the plastic part. So under the cover and the third thing i'm printing is door holder so the idea for them is like instead of holding the door they just push it for them and then open the door the face mask just one face mask it takes three hours and a half right now i'm printing four of them at the same time it took me like 12 hours take a time and for for the face shield, also the same thing, like for an hour and a half, because take a time. The door is less time, it's like two an hour, because it's smaller than the other product. So yeah, the, the community is kind of ramping up because um, I had a, another contact from a person in Burlington, because Burlington has just had a whole bunch of outbreaks um, at their nursing home. I think it was 10 or 15, 20. A huge uh, breakout there of COVID. And so they're kind of scrambling to find PPE, the protective uh, equipment. Um, and so I think we're going to start to see this just really explode. I think we're going to see everybody coming and talking to us, getting the models and files. And there's going to be a whole maker community working here in Poria to get all this stuff built out. Thank you to Rob and our learning technology team for all they're doing for the common good. And now we turn to another important service that IT provides to the university, and that's making sense of all the data across many IT systems. I sat down with Diane Graves, the Director of Data Management, for all the details. Thank you for sitting down with us today, Diane. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your team and what you do for the university? My team is the Data Management and Analytics team. 
and we work with NIT, but we provide information uh, across campus to a variety of offices. We provide uh, information about students and majors to academic departments, and we provide additional information to administrative departments. The information we provide generally comes from the banner system. We can report on students, uh, finance information, financial aid, and other aspects of data captured within Banner. Most of the information we provide is generated in an extract form so that individuals who receive the information are looking at unit records about their students or about their employees. Additionally, however, we can provide data in a dashboard format and we will be doing more of that in the, in the near future, in the next year. Okay, okay. Uh, can you give us an example of a typical report? A typical report um, for that we process um, is generally, in the most part, related to student information, um, where an academic department or an administrative unit will contact us. They'll submit a report request, and we will, you know, once that report request has been re approved, we will go to work and start looking for the data in the banner system, pulling it together and giving it back to the requester in the format they wanted. A lot of the information, as I said, is related to student and one of our most important and most used reports is the Universal Majors and Minors Report. That report can uh, captures a lot of information about majors within a particular academic department and it it can be used by all departments across campus if they are related to students or student access. When they request this particular report, they request the information for their department only and for their major, and they can get the format in a variety of formats, um, and they can request uh, output that would include a mailing address or a permanent address. The report includes a, a wealth of information about each student, including their email. So typically this report is um, used in a lot of ways to determine how student progress is happening and also for contacting students within a particular academic department. Okay, how would I go about requesting a new report? When a person wants a new report at 365, and they can request, they can find that form in Form Central, and they fill out the form request, the report request, uh, with with any necessary information that's going to help us develop the best report for them, and then they get approval um, from their department, from the FERPA coordinator, and ultimately the report request is then sent to the data management and analytics team, and um, and then it is given to a report developer um, to be finished. Part of the process of requesting a new report is to review the output before we publish it in an active directory. How long does it take to get a new report created then? And do I need approval? An important part of um, requesting a report is two things actually. One is the awareness that it's going to take a little time to get a new report developed. Um, it, may, it may take two weeks. Uh, and that, the, that is because we have workload that we're already, you know, working on. And, um, and then we've, we add the new report into, into that chain. The other thing that's very important is the understanding that there's going to be approval process. Um, we are very sensitive to student uh, privacy and we will not give unit record out to anyone unless it is, has been approved by the FERPA coordinator. Um, so those are two things that we need to keep in mind when we're requesting new reports. You must get a lot of requests for the same report. Um, how do I know if a report already exists? We often get a re, uh, request for a report that already exists, and it can be a challenge. We have a lot of reports, and so for us, it can be a challenge to search and find that report that's already out there so that we're not duplicating something that already exists. A lot of times within departments, uh, the person that was running 
a particular report uh, resigns or leaves and a new person is not in place before all of that information has been shared. So the new person comes in and requests a new report and not knowing that it already exists. So it's, um, it's, it's kind of on us, it's kind of on the requester to do a little bit of homework and um, to make sure that we're not duplicating reports. But it does happen and uh, we're, we try to, to eliminate duplication, but I know that it does happen. So it's kind of on, in, in the balls in both courts in that situation where we try to keep the duplication at a minimal. Okay. If I were a new employee, how would I know if my department already has reports created? If I were a new employee, um, one of the things that I would do is ask about the Cognos um, folder for my department. I mean, at some point, Cognos is going to come up in is going to come up for most new employees in an academic or administrative office because we have so many reports that do exist. And so when that new employee uh, is, is asked to get a new report or to run a report, um, probably what would be best is if they just called uh, or, or sent a Teams message to, to my department and asked about well, you know, what already exists out here uh, for Cognos. What do I have available that I could run uh, without asking for something new? And then we could go through some of the reports that will give us an opportunity to review what's active and what's what's kind of gone stagnant and what's no longer needed. Um, so that would be one thing to do, and we'd certainly be glad to help with that process. Cognos seems to be an important part of delivering data to our users. Uh, can you tell us about Cognos and how I would access it? Cognos is a very powerful tool. It is an IBM tool. Um, that says a lot about it right there. Um, it is very powerful and we're probably using uh, just a portion of a thumbnail uh, of it. We hope to use more of it in the future. In fact, uh, the next version of Cognos, which we're in the process of upgrading to, is Cognos 11 and also known as Cognos Analytics. That will take us into a new arena where we can provide dashboard information, more information that's at a glance perhaps, uh, certainly more reports rather than simply data extracts. We'd like to provide information that people can use at a glance. They can come in in the morning and they could take a look at their dashboard and say, wow, here's where our numbers are and this is where we want them to be. Right now, uh, getting to a Cognos report can seem a little clunky because you're going down through multiple layers in multiple directories. And um, my goal over the next year um, is to make that process simpler, where we'll access it more in the format that we access things on, um, on Hornet 365. I want to be able to see tiles of reports um, to, make it, to make it more accessible to the people that need that information. If you could share one piece of information or advice to any of our users, well, what would that be? If I were to leave a piece of advice for our users, I would frame it in this way, and that is that the uh, data management and analytics team works closely with registration and the FERPA coordinator and with the Office of Institutional Effectiveness to provide the um, to provide accurate information to all of our requesters, all of our users, and um, we are conscious of accuracy, um, we're conscious of privacy, and we want to make sure that the information that we are providing is indeed necessary and timely. So I would, the one piece of advice I would give users is to plan ahead. Um, you give us some, uh, some breathing room to work on their request, but also to realize that the wealth of information that we have is huge. And um, there are a number of questions that can be answered with the data that we can provide. Thank you for uh, talking with me today. I enjoyed the opportunity to give this information to the campus. Thank you. Okay, okay. Thank you so much, Diane, for answering all of our questions and joining us on It Only Takes a Minute.
And now, we go from our data reporting to data security, mainly our new service for encrypting email messages. John Garofola from our information security team tells us why we would need to encrypt emails and how we can go about doing it. This week, we announced a new service for email encryption. What is the difference between an encrypted email and one that I send 100 times a week? Well, Tyler, for most of us who are using Outlook desktop version 2019 or the web version, there's very little difference in how you read, write, and interact with an encrypted email. The main difference is technical. With encryption selected, your email will become scrambled by Outlook to prevent anyone other than the author and the recipient from reading it. The documentation mentions PII, HIPAA, FERPA, and intellectual property. Can you give us some examples of these? Certainly. Uh, financial aid documents, healthcare patient information, sports physical exam results, student grades, musical compositions, or copywritten work are all examples of information that should be sent with encryption. Now, let's say I do need to send a student their grade. If that student replies back to me from their Gmail, doesn't that mean it's no longer encrypted? Uh, that's a good question to raise. Um, and historically, the answer would have been no. With encrypted email through Microsoft Outlook, however, any email you send encrypted will remain encrypted, even if you send an email to someone using Gmail, Yahoo, or really any other email service. Once you've started a conversation that is encrypted in Microsoft Outlook, that conversation will continue to be transmitted using encryption, even after multiple replies. When I send an encrypted email, it looks like I have four options to choose from. You're recommending that most users select the first one, encrypt only. Can you tell us a little bit more about these options? Certainly, and it really depends on what platform you're using to access Outlook. There could be up to four options shown. There are four options shown depending upon the Outlook interface you're using. Some options aren't available on Outlook for the web, for example. Two options that are available regardless of the platform you use are encrypt only and do not forward. We recommend these options because they are the only options that allow email to be sent off campus to students using Gmail accounts, ESU foundation donors, and vendors, for example. There seems to be some confusion around the version of Outlook you need. If I'm on Windows, what version do I need? Well, Tyler, the short answer is Outlook version 2019 for desktop users and uh, Outlook 2016 users can read and reply to encrypted mail, um, but not all can. Microsoft has not made it easy to identify which version to look for specifically. One quick way to determine whether or not your Outlook is ready to send encrypted mail is to create a new email and click the options tab. If you see a padlock icon that says encrypt beneath it, you're all set. If you see an envelope icon that says permissions beneath it, you're on a version that may not support sending encrypted email. And what about a Mac? The ability to send encrypted email does not really depend upon your operating system, rather the version of Outlook you're using. If you're using Outlook 2019 on Windows, Mac, or even some other operating system, you're good to go. And everyone can use the web version, right? What about the mobile versions on Outlook? A lot of people are using iPhones and iPads, for example. Well, that's a good point. Users of the Outlook mobile app can read and reply to encrypted email on their phone like any normal email. The only difference is mobile app users are not currently able to initiate an encrypted email, but we're hopeful to see that functionality soon. We talked about how email encryption has to be started from our own Outlook environment, but it will work with Gmail or Yahoo Mail, etc. But you're still recommending that if I'm going to send you an encrypted email, that I send you an unencrypted one just to give you a heads up. Can you elaborate a little more on that? That's right. Uh, due to valid concerns from email recipients regarding clicking links in email, specifically to log in to a service, it's best to avoid confusion and concern by sending an advanced email, text, or call to the intended recipient of your encrypted email. This is primarily applicable if they are not a current ESU student, faculty, or staff. To clarify, the actual email that is being encrypted will include ESU branding. I'll be able to see it's not a phishing attempt, right? Yeah, that's right. We've worked diligently to minimize the fishy appearance of these encrypted email notifications. The ESU branding colors have been applied to add to the legitimacy of the email, and we have examples posted of that email notification, as well as web addresses that users should be sent to after they click the email link. If there's ever any doubt about the legitimacy of an email, call the IT help desk for confirmation. Who is the intended audience of this service? And how many users do you expect will be able to use it? 
Well, the initial groups that we saw this service being most beneficial to are those involved in health services, finance, admissions, and human resources. But really anyone on campus can benefit from adding security to their communications. If I'm an administrative assistant and I needed to send a grade to my department chair for whatever reason, would I use this since we're all using the same email system? Or would I need to send an encrypted email only if I was going to email somebody externally like a Gmail account? Well, really, you're encouraged to use encryption settings anytime you're emailing anything that is considered sensitive or protected information, regardless of the intended recipient. Thank you for answering all of our questions. Now, John is actually going to demonstrate how easy it is to send an encrypted message. Hello, this is a quick walkthrough on how to send encrypted email from your desktop Outlook client. First, we'll start with a new email. From here, it's as simple as selecting the Options tab. Look for the padlock icon with Encrypt beneath it. And select either Encrypt Only or Do Not Forward. For the most part, we recommend just using the Encrypt Only option. You can go back to Messages and complete your email as normal, filling out the two CC lines if necessary and subject. Once you're ready to send the email, simply click Send and you've completed the process. Now this is uh, what's displayed whenever an Emporia State University or other Outlook user receives an encrypted email that they can't open natively with an Outlook. Very simple to access these particular emails. Just click the included link in the body of the email. It will open a separate web browser tab using the URL outlook.office365.com. This is a virtual version of Microsoft Outlook. And this is what a user with Gmail, a Yahoo, or anybody using a, an older version of Microsoft Outlook previous to Office 2016. From here, you've got all of your standard functions, reply all, delete, uh, mark as junk, block recipient. We can also go ahead and download uh, any attachments or view them directly. Whenever the individual or recipient has completed the attached documentation, they can simply attach it here by clicking reply, filling out all the necessary information, and then sending it using this icon right here. It's as simple as that. Last week, we announced the winner of our information security training contest. Congratulations to Debbie Redeker. We hope she enjoys that new Amazon Kindle. And thank you to all the entrants who completed the training by the end of March. And finally, we'd like to know your favorite place to Zoom. From Gotham City, to the Great Wall of China, to even the bridge of the Starship Enterprise, we've added our most creative Zoom backgrounds and we'd like to see yours. Post screenshots of your Zoom session or background images to our Twitter or Facebook and tag us. That's all we have for this episode of It Only Takes a Minute. If you're watching us on YouTube and you found this video useful, hit the like button and subscribe for first access to our latest videos. You can now also see our complete episode list on our new page by pointing your web browser to hornet.digital. I'm Tyler Parker. Have a great day and stay safe.